Jeff, welcome to the Abraham's Pod podcasting pod times. How are you? Pod. I'm potted. I'm as potted as can be. Then it's working perfectly so far. Jeff, yeah. you're an old friend of the pod, you, but you're a first time caller in or to the um, video pod. So welcome you. Ooh, thanks. Well, How are you today? Uh, huh? How are you today? Man, I've had a great, a very busy day, but a delightful day. This morning, uh, I, I did two enjoyable and taxing things, which is I get up early on uh, Friday mornings. This is Friday. And I see our first caller is already. <laughs> Dayton. Hello. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, so sorry about that. We'll just. Real uh, quick, we'll... I, with the video, I imagine you're at the firehouse. And because the, the brick back there kind of reminds me like a firehouse. And there, there's a call and you're like, you know what? They can, they can wait. We are you know doing what? a podcast. This podcast is going to be so good. Earl, would you take this one? Thank you. Uh, Just right off camera is the fire pole where we go uh -huh. down. I'm on the fourth floor right now. And uh, boy, is it fun going down that pole. This morning, um, I, got to, I got to record music with a buddy. And uh, that's fun. You know, I'm, I'm always trying to cook on something. And uh, I try to do that on Friday mornings with a buddy. And went straight from there to um, there is a... There's a ministry here in Cincinnati, and they primarily work do every kind of thing with uh, with urban ministries and inner, inner city ministries you can imagine. So uh, addiction help and and hmm. helping people get work and relief work and uh, after school programs, whole thing. And I was with that ministry today doing some uh, training with them, like how to just kind of minister to people, um, generally. Um, Fun. that was great. It was, a, it was, it's been a good full day and satisfying. And it's, it's an unusual thing that's happening in Cincinnati today, which is cold, but mm. dry. Oh, what a nice change from sloppy, wet. That that's not cool. No, no. Yeah. Sloppy, how wet. How is it where you are in Denver, CO? Cold. I went for a run this morning. It was less than 10 degrees, and I like that kind of run. I like it good. How do you suit up for that run? Uh, layers. I just put on as many layers as possible. Any clothes I can find when I'm walking around the house, I put on. I run in a quilt. But you, uh, don't, you don't want to run in a big old puffy down jacket, no, do you? I don't. I, I do. I, 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 well, to be honest... I haven't showered since, so I could probably start showing you the different layers. <laughs> but there's a there's a shell layer that goes over this this uh, fleece that keeps me warm. And you know it's a good run when you start off. Oh, it's cold. My face is cold, but it's yes. gonna be okay. And then by the end, you're like, wow, I, I could disrobe a little right. Yes, now. That, that feels is like a good, good run. run. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and what on the bottom? Just just for curiosity's sake. What what are we wearing on the bottoms these days? Uh, just the tightest, uh, smallest uh, bit of short because I like I like to feel the sting on my thighs. Uh, it's it's uh, long underwear uh, coupled with just a pair of jogging pants over it. And if the and if the long underwear is is strong enough, if it has enough moxie, I'll say if it's got enough moxie, then I think uh, my legs will stay warm. Yeah. And then shoes. I used to do the Nigerian bare, and it just didn't work. Yeah. Too many. Too much construction. Um, I'm. I'm with you. If, if the, uh, I have the thicker, I have the thicker, like insulated tights. Um, Those, we don't have to say that. We don't have to say tights as men. What right? do you want to call them? Uh, 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 underwear, uh, like long underwear. I'm okay, never going to call them I do the thicker tights. insulated long underwear. And then okay. the, you know, the sweat jogging It's not a sweatpants. Right. I don't believe in sweatpants in public. It's uh, it's yeah. it's it's like a jogging pant, and if the, if those two layers aren't if I if it's so painful that I can't be outside in those two layers, then we're not doing it. We're we're not yeah. going. That's it. One of my favorite runs was about this time last year. We hit the coldest it's been in Colorado in forever, and at the time I had a I had a good looking beard, and by the t and I don't I don't know the science of this. No gray. We we can con well, there was some gray. Okay. We can contact the people at NASA to figure out what's going on. But I came home, and I mean, the moisture, I guess, in the air, I it was all ice, and it's it was one of my favorite days. 
And you I, thought, I, I, today I am a man. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Ragnar. Yeah, Jeff Shackleton. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Let me real quick. Uh, wh- wh- while we're staying away from the topic at hand, yeah. uh, you know, my favorite story of the Shackleton, this favorite bit of the Shackleton story, if you okay. don't know the Shackleton story, you should look into it. But his right hand man's name, this is my favorite name, and I often use this when I have to give uh, my name to someone. Fud Ruckers. Chippy McNish. That's a great name. Chippy McNish. <laughs> That's a fab name. I've remembered it for the last 30 years, I think. And so when pressed at a Fud Ruckers yeah. or somewhere else, uh, and they're like, what's your name? Chippy McNish. Okay. Which also at Fud Ruckers, you can order a Chippy McNish. Delicious. And uh-huh. do people re- react when you tell them that name? It, or no, because it'd be on PC. What are they going to say? Oh. oh, that's a weird name. You can't oh, say that anymore. This guy said my name was weird. I deserve a free burger now. <laughs> okay, here's what's great about Fud. I was just having a conversation with a buddy. Fud Ruckers, great hamburgers, great fries, the whole thing. And I haven't I been there it. in years. I haven't been there in years. But you know what? I, you know where I'm going with this. Uh, what, the plunger with the cheese sauce. Plunger with jalapeno cheese sauce at no extra charge. And you put it on everything. You just drizzle in the drink everything. Of course. Of I, course. I, oh. Okay. Here, here I, I was gonna I was gonna mention this. So I'm glad you brought it up. I don't know if, the, if there's even FUD records that are open anymore, but we're still gonna talk about the here's the combination of of glory. Mm. At FUD Ruckers, they serve uh they serve the really fat wedge fries like uh, KFC <laughs> used to do where yeah. it's like an eighth of a potato. Um, it's like, it's like it's a if, trivial if, pursuit piece of a potato. Yes. It's like if, if a potato worked like an orange in sections, that's what a, <laughs> that's what a potato wedge at Fuddruckers is like. Uh-huh. You got those big, big, manly hunks of potato and you've got the cheese sauce from a plunger it's magic i I, I mean if we're going on calories and starch and stuff that's really that's your rda right there those two things you're done oh i I, they're still in houston i was just talking to a buddy of mine uh, about this the other day and reminiscing and he said back in the day he mowed mr fuddruckers lawn the guy who started fuddruckers what yeah. It was, I always assumed little... that was a silly made up name. Well, I say Mr. Fuddrucker. It was actually Mr. Um, uh, whoever, uh, Romano, because he also made Romano's macaroni grill. He's done well, Mr. Romano. I, I don't know what else he's done, but he's two for two. You can just walk away and go, even if it was just the cheese sauce, <laughs> he could go, I'll take my Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> and quietly exit the stage. Oh, this is one. This is one of my 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 lines from the college days: is whatever flavor chemist made up the chili cheese Frito, let's give him the Nobel Peace Prize because this is an amazing invention. Yes, he's he's he, he, he it was bless him. Yeah, bless him. Fuddruckers, excellent. Well. That's all the time we have. Oh, sorry. (laughs) I thought that was it. It does feel that way. Let's move on because you and I are both interested in this topic at hand today. Give me a little intro for for talking about the whole world of reading to your children. It's important, and it's something that I would imagine most dads shy away from because it requires a gear for you to go into that could feel uncomfortable or even yeah. feel embarrassing maybe like, right. Oh, I got to go in. I'm not an acty kind of guy. That's not my background. And I've got to read the kids and Hey, totally get it. Like, and, and the fact is you're probably also reading right before bedtime, yeah. which is a, a, a tense time. Sometimes there's, there's, there's a balance. There's a delicate balance there of, you're tired. They're tired. Does it have to go perfect? Oh, it just feels really weird. But there is so much, there can be so much joy and benefit in reading to your children that it makes all of the uh, tenseness around it worth it. And also realizing it's a great time of play where I'm, I'm allowing myself 
an opportunity to try some things with it by reading certain ways and just having fun with it. I, you know, isn't one of the definitions of fun that you're enjoying yourself while you're also taking some chances and you, there's not this uh, fear of failure that's coding the whole thing. Yeah. Well, great. L let's, uh, we're going to get into the benefits of doing it, but I wanted to start with um, sort of a, the springboard of scripture to get into the subject of reading aloud to children, because I, have, I haven't found the verses that say uh, read aloud to your kids, um, but there are concepts in the scriptures that would certainly lead us to that water from which we could drink. Um, I'm going to read a couple of passages. Um, one, we, we've had Mark Douglas on before talking about uh, Psalm 144. He says this is his favorite passage regarding sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. And it's a prayer. Psalm 144 is a prayer, um, a request to God. And it says, Let our sons in their youth be like plants full grown. Interesting, interesting uh, phrase there. Let our sons in their youth be like plants full grown. And let our daughters, like corner pillars, fashioned for a palace. <laughs> let our barns be full, supplying every kind of produce, and our flocks bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields. Let our cattle bear without mishap and without loss, and let there be no outcry in our streets. How blessed and favored are the people in such circumstance! How blessed! and prosperous are the people whose God is the Lord. So there is a, I'm, I'm reading that whole picture so you can understand the context in which there is a prayer made for one's children that they might be, um, certainly for the sons, the request is that they might be preternaturally mature, right? Mm -hmm. And for the daughters, I mean, that they, that they would be in their youth like plants full grown, and the daughters that they would be like corner pillars fashioned for a palace. So they might be, uh, we could just fill in the blank. What does that mean? Well, it certainly means they're upright. It means they can take responsibility. It means that they're well fashioned. They weren't thrown together. Um, and there's something stately and uh, royal about their bearing. So in this picture, this full picture that's given to us in Psalm 144 of the of the good life of someone who is prosperous in every way, there there is a picture of fullness. Um, I think that's an important thing for us to get our head around. What is biblical prosperity and what does fullness look like? Well, it's something that we should be praying for and working toward and expecting. And you, could, you can consider that with your children. What does fullness look like? What does early maturity look like? What does stateliness and royalty look like? Um, I don't think you have to go very far to assume that that means, among other things, that they're, they're intellectually developed, that they are emotionally composed, um, and that it's, it's sort of like... Um, um, the idea of Jesus growing in, in stature, yeah. wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, there's this picture of fullness in all things. They, they said of Jesus, he doeth all things well. He, he's great at speaking. He's great at, we know that Jesus was a, a great trained carpenter. He was good with numbers. He was um, a great philosopher. He understood, he was empathetic. He was um, courageous. All these things he was well formed in. So we want our children to be well formed, and and I'm just sticking in there. Um, by the way, by the way, that's not the only passage where this picture um, is, is mentioned of your children being like mature plants. Psalm 128 says the same thing that your children will be like olive shoots around your table, and. So we want to equip our children, uh, Abe's Wallet people, and, and I know you, Jeff, are aware of five capitals. And so there's at least five areas where we want our children to be mature, well-rounded, and to grow up. Um, we're going to get to how uh, reading to them can check several of these boxes. So I'll just leave that on the side and just make the statement, we want our children to be mature, 
We want them to be intelligent. We want them to be emotionally capable. And it's our job as fathers to figure out how do we do that? How do we help that process along? So sometimes that means encouragement. Sometimes it means putting challenges in front of them and watching them struggle with those challenges. Sometimes it means um, that we're coaching them along the way, doing something with them, et cetera, et cetera. Psalm 103, 13 says, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And so this kind of heart toward your children, um, it comes from the Lord. And so when, when he has a desire, we can just look, he has a desire to equip us. He has a desire to, to mature us, to grow us up. So we can obviously learn from him to go, what, what is the heart of a father? We just look at our heavenly father and go, well, what is he like toward us? That's the way I want to be to my children. And it helps fill in the blanks for us about a lot of things that the Bible's kind of rather silent on. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how, how do we, d- does the Bible actually, I don't think that it says, I don't think it actually says anywhere, you know, fathers be encouraging to your children. I don't think that's in the Bible. Um, but we can easily look, read between the lines and go like, is the father encourage us? We know that it tells us don't discourage your children. It says that in Ephesians. Um, don't, don't be frustrating to them. I've been guilty of that before, you know, uh, egging your children on and like torturing them a little bit because because you think it's hilarious or something. Uh, you know, sorry, sorry, God. I do that sometimes. Um, but the, but the father has compassion on us and we're to have that same compassion toward our children. It reminds me of, um, Michael Pearl who, who writes and speaks a lot about child rearing talks about, I think this might've even been a little book that uh, he and his wife made one time about tying heartstrings and that tying heartstrings is so important that we, we've kind of talked about this before, but we want the culture of our relationship with our children and the culture of our home to be so great that worldly culture doesn't um, break that pull. So we want to develop such powerful allegiances in our children's youth and such strong relationships, not just of, not just of happy time, but of also respect, obedience. We have to develop this culture that is both loving and obedience-based because that's the fullness that, that we have with God. And so we, we want to be developing these things. So here's, so here's, the, here's the question at the end of all of that uh, preamble. Is there a way to build my children up, equipping their hearts and minds at the same time in a way that's enjoyable, it's a low bar and I could lay down while I'm doing it. <laughs> what do you think, Jeff? Is there I, something I, that, is there something that checks all those boxes? Gosh, I, if only there were, what, what, <laughs> what, what magical activity could it be reading to your children? It's reading to your children. I love the idea that you get to lay down. It, it, <laughs> it, there is a, something like, Hey, you're going to challenge yourself with your voice. You're going to challenge yourself getting into this. The least you can do for yourself is be, 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 uh, yeah, be comfortable. Supine. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. I agree with everything you're saying, obviously. And it, it's, I guess I, I go, okay, well, if we're supposed to take our cues for God, from God, uh, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. Would God read to us? Yeah, I think that's kind of what he does when he presents the scriptures and the stories to us. He's yes. giving us stories to, and so we could take that and go, well, I guess I got to do that for my kids. I've got to, I've got to bring them stories as well. And, you know, again, I, I don't think, I think you'd be hard pressed to look in the Bible and find a place where it says, read aloud to your children. You'd also be hard pressed to find a place where it says, whatever you do, don't read to your children. There's, it's not, it's not <laughs> sure. a non, like it, it would be dumb to get to that. So I think this does tick all the boxes you're talking about. It creates that it, it is, it, I think you'll agree with me. We can talk more about this and unpack it a little, but it creates an odd fun. I, I say odd only in that may, maybe the right word is unique bond between you and your children. Yeah. When you're, when you're, uncovering a story together, particularly for the first time. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you will be reading things to our children that we've read before as a kid. And that's, that's fine. There's all, but going through a story together for the first time, I remember uh, a few years ago, 
I do speaker coaching and I was working with a guy out in Silicon Valley who was very, he was a very successful uh, venture capitalist guy, but he had a great family and he had a great relationship with his kids. And people were asking him to give talks at their organizations, not about raising money, but about how do you, a Silicon Valley powerhouse, have great relationships with your kids? So he started doing these talks. And so mm. I was brought in to help work on one of these talks with him. And one of the things he said was uh, he, he had gr uh, grown sons, uh, I think a uh, teenager or above. And he said, one of the most powerful things that we would do together wasn't just activities, go skiing, go mountain biking, whatever. It was doing something and learning something new together. Cool. And he said, when we learn something new at the same time, it took away some of the hierarchy. And, and right. I, I, there's a there's a place for the hierarchy. But when they're able to look at dad and go, dad's going, I don't know how to hold the paintbrush. Right. I don't, let's, how do you? And then suddenly together you're experiencing this. He said, there is such a joy and a benefit to mm. that. And I think we could we could file reading a book together that we have not read before. Uh, under that same thing. You're uncovering it together. You're having the joy of discovery together, mm. even making little predictions to oh, I think it's going to be, now don't blow it because you're smarter than your kid, hopefully. You're not, well, let me tell you what's going to happen. It's going to be this. <laughs> oh, thanks, dad. So they all killed him. Great. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Don't do that. But it, uncovering stuff together, I think there's such a joy in that. We've yeah. been experiencing this in a series we've been reading lately and I love it. It just feels like, you know what it is? It, it's the actualized version of what watching a TV show with your kid is like a faint version of where uh -huh. you're with watching a TV. You're like, Oh, kind of, but reading a book together. I mean, now it sounds, what was it? Riff? Is, is that what it was back in the eighties? Reading is fundamental. Oh those, yeah. Those are the PSAs. Yeah. RIF. And can I talk about John Howard or is that now? Go yeah, I think I'm punched a guy. Cool with that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, he used to talk about, uh, I have a problem. I love to read. Reading engages more of your brain than watching a TV show. Let me just throw something out here. You and I have talked many times about uh, TV, about uh -huh. jingles, about well, we've got a lot of TV information stored in our brains as children of the 80s. Mm -hmm. I just want to throw this out to you because when you say riff, I didn't know what you meant until you said reading is fundamental. I would like to quote to you part of the the PSA. Okay, wait, wait. Just so, just so everyone knows, I'm about to so enjoy what's going to go down here. <laughs> right, riff. That's riff. R A F. Box two three four four four, Washington D.C. Thanks, Carol. She pulls on the her earlobe. <laughs> Right, RIF, R I F, Box 23444, Washington, D.C. Can we, can we link this in the sure? In the, sure. Okay, I'll go, ahead. I'll go find the RIF, uh, I'll, I'll find the RIF video and, and link it. Right here. Go, go see it. Check me out. You tell me if it's not box 23444, Washington, D.C. I love it. See, you kids don't know this, but back in the day when we'd watch cartoons on Saturday morning, it, it was, it was, you know how your mom will make something really unhealthy and then she'll throw like a vegetable on the side. You're like, oh, okay, we just got to, this, this yeah, sort of makes gotta, mom feel better. You got to work past that to get to the, get yeah. To the good stuff. That's how the networks functioned. Yes. And actually, from what I understand, there were real laws on the books that said you could have so much, you could have so many uh, commercials for Flintstone cereal, uh, Fruity Pebbles and whatnot, as long as you had some sort of educational moment along the way. And so it would be something like in the news or and it would be a the more, you know, bum, 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 bum. or my our favorite. I think we've talked about this before. <laughs> I hanker for a hunk of cheese. Oh. There was a whole cartoon Slobber that was just in Kirka. Yeah. Yeah. What was that guy's time for timer? For no good reason, this guy's name was Timer. He looked like something <laughs> you would pick off a pillow in a motel <laughs> and throw away. And he's, he's encouraging you to eat cheese. <laughs> Uh, according I, to the president's council on cheese intake, I, I'm going to take dietary low. 
I'm going to take nutrition advice from this guy with the top hat. He's, he's got legs that are sticks and this huge middle body that's disgusting. And a cane. When well, something's thinks, gone wrong, something he's, he's got a cane. Something is wrong. And he's telling you what I enjoy is a wagon wheel. Remember? Uh, yeah, what was a wagon wheel? It was a cheese between two, two uh, crack, crackers. Yeah, he, he, this genius came up with this. <laughs> But there was also one, I sing this to myself all the time, and you and I have talked about this many times. Uh, there was a character named the Fonz on a show called Happy Days. Well, he was everywhere. And they did a takeoff of this guy. And it was, what was the, what was the little bit? Let's say it together. Yeah. Exercise your chompers. Uh, chompers. Really. Chew, 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 chew. Exercise those chompers on some good, good hard, hard foods. Food. Yeah. So the whole, I, to this day, I, I sing this song, but to this day, was that a problem? Were children eating such soft foods that dentists are going in going, gosh, these teeth are barely, these have not been exercised properly. Samuel so, has only been eating applesauce, Carol. <laughs> What's been going on? So then, so then the animators get together and they go, we're going to solve this problem. Let's bring in the Fonz. Let's hey, bring in chomper. a You know what we need? A greaser. A greaser. We need that. We need the sweat hogs. We need Sha Na Na. We need fun. And the and the the punchline of the whole thing is, hey Champa, how about running a few laps with us? <laughs> nah, man, I'm eating a celery stick. This is hard exercise. Oh man, you're the best. You got it. You nailed you it. Go. So, uh, with all this to say, reading is fundamental. Used to talk about, and we don't need to go down this road too much. But reading engages more of your mind. And listening to someone read a story engages so much more of your mind than watching a television show. Yes, watching a television show, watching a movie engages a fair amount of you. But obviously, you're, you're using your brain to create the world right. as you listen or read more than just watching the visual depiction of it. Right. I, I, um, I'm so curious about what illustrators do when we're reading a book together. That I will offer t to my children. Would you look? Where every fourth chapter, there's a picture. You want to see this picture? And many times, they'll go. I, we don't want to see the picture. Huh. We we got it. We got we got our little world. We don't know when need. We don't want to know what some illustrator thought about it. I think that's interesting. Isn't, I, it, isn't it disappointing? Sometimes you get to the picture and you go, No, that's not no, what he no. looks like. That's, that's not at all. Who's this? Yeah. Yes, I agree. Um. Well, because I'm a thorough uh, researcher, as you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I've got a little list of benefits of reading. And so you've mentioned a couple and you can chip in as you want. So I'll throw out because I feel like one thing we're trying to do on this podcast is we're trying to plead with and influence fathers to try this. So yeah. I want you to know how I, I remember hearing when my first child was nine months old, the number one thing you can do for their intelligence is read to them. Yes. And I've told the story of um, one thing that I, what, that I realized that as soon as a child can talk, whatever you say to them at night, you could, you could read the, uh, you could read the bill of rights to them. And if you read the bill of rights to them, Every night for three weeks, they could quote the Bill of Rights to you. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's when I started reading scripture passages to my kids, and I choicefully would repeat them to mm -hmm. them. And that's how uh, one of my children was born again, was they mm -hmm. just said that God was working that scripture into their heart, and I had mm -hmm. no idea. But um, that if you have toddlers... Fathers, you must find a place in your schedule to read to your kids. We're going to finish this episode by looking at the times that you can read to your children. What are the opportunities to read to them? Mm -hmm. So good. here's some benefits. As Jeff has already said, number one, it's there's pleasure there. It's fun. And as I mentioned, tying heartstrings with your children is important. So we want to have great experiences with them. So it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a container in which you can put anything that you want. You're interested in science. Great. You're interested in basketball biographies, Oscar Robertson, Cincinnatian. Great. Do that. Read that. Um, 
Number two, this is one of the things I appreciate the most about it is because it's kind of like I, I annoy my family. Uh, we still watch uh, um, Little House on the Prairie episodes, which that's not what annoys my family. What annoys my family is that I'm constantly pausing it to make a point about something. I can't, I wish I, I wish, I wish I could sit with all of you and watch an episode of Little House on the Prairie so that I could pause it and turn to you and go, can you believe this is on television? Can you believe this was on a Tuesday night that this was the story in primetime television that a man learned how to pray? That was the story. How can I can't, I can't even conceive that this was that a network made this show anyways. So I'm you constantly, need to, you need to do pop-up video for a little house in the prairie. I would, I would love it. Just, just a think about this thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I'm constantly pausing to make a point. Now you see what he's saying here. What he's saying here is that a father has a responsibility to work for his family. That's what is being said right here. Oh yeah, we all talk about that a little bit. Um, well, a book I think is a way more natural way to do the same thing. I love it because it's a platform for discussing values, discussing beliefs, and we can pull apart why this character did this thing. What do you think she's actually saying there? What, mm -hmm. what do you think, what's her heart like? And you're just coaching your children through your worldview. Mm -hmm. And so I, I love that it's a forum for, for discussing values. Um, the third benefit of reading to your kids, and Jeff has already touched on this, is intelligence. You want to build the intelligence of your kids. It's one of the five capitals. Um, one, and I, and this is my research talking here, by the way, to, to build up my own credibility, hmm. I'm, I'm lucky to live in Cincinnati where there, there are, there are, I think two or three homeschooling convention centers uh, across the country where there's annually a homeschooling convention and all of these educators come in, take over a convention center and then do. 150 different lectures and you kind of get to pick and choose what you want. I like to go to the homeschool convention just to learn, just, just because it, I think it makes me a better father. Um, and I sat in a lecture, Jeff, one time, I don't know if you know this on reading stories to your kids. Did I tell you that? No. On reading to your children. And I took copious notes. I would have no, no idea where those uh, notes are. I would use them if I, if I had them. But I wonder if it was this woman, is her name Sarah McKenzie? She does no, read aloud revival. No, forget okay. Sarah McKenzie. Oh, no, sorry. I, I forgot was, her already. <laughs> I've never heard of her. It was just a man. That's all I remember. Oh, well. Well, I didn't say it was a woman. Okay. Uh, that's one of Johnny Cash's lesser known songs, A Man Named Sarah. Sarah McKenzie. Sarah McKenzie. Okay. Um, it expands the vocabulary of your children. Mm -hmm because they're hearing new words in new contexts. It builds the connection between the spoken and written word and helps them uh, and helps impart the impact of the written word. Hmm. So can I just, I wonder if there's any important books that you would want your kids to know that it's, it's, there's impact in the written word. Could I think of a book? that I would want them to know that it's important the rest of their lives. What would that book be? I'm coming up short. Okay. Well, if there was a book, let's say God uh -huh. wrote a book and, oh, and, right. uh, and you would want your kids to know that the written word is important. This would help do that. Mm. Um, really interesting. I, I, can, I, so many examples were coming to mind as, as I uh, was prepping for this. One is that just last night I was reading a sentence um, in a book that I'm reading with, uh, with my girls. And it was like, um, Jared is the only one who can turn the magical key into the door. And uh, my youngest said, was that all caps that you, huh. that, that you read that that way? And I said, no, it was in italics. And she said, what's italics? Mm -hmm. I said, it's when the letters are slanted on the, oh, I've seen that before. Okay. So it was like, Jared is the 
only one who could turn the key. And she's like, oh, I see why you read it that way. And I mm-hmm. thought, my kids are geniuses. <laughs> you're just, you're just seeing the, you know, you're seeing the gears turn. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, also, it increases their attention span for the love of God and all things holy. It increases the attention span. Would you like something to try to undo the incredible damage that screen addiction is doing to your children. Um, this increases attention span because the, the story is being teased out slowly. Hmm. And one thing that we like, I mean, this is just normal, but it happens in my house a lot where somebody will go, wait, um, now who is Boromir again? Okay. Remember Boromir it's related to Faramir. He had this, th- Oh, I remember him. And wasn't his, his attitudes kind of like this. Yes. That's what he's like. Okay. Now we walk back into the scene and we're, we're making these connections of, of this fabric in our brains that we retain. We remember, we can project forward based on what a story is doing, et cetera. Um, and children learn how to listen better pay attention and concentrate. Mm. Are they think those are values for intelligence? Yes. You want your kids to pay attention and concentrate and listen? Yes. And as Jeff was just saying a second ago, it strengthens cognition um, because children are not only imagining the scenarios that they're, that are being read to them, but they're also doing things like, I know you, I've heard you talk about this before, Jeff, that they're doing um, this. It's almost like a game but it's a it's a thing where they're solving the problems of the characters that they're listening to and and empathy is developed because you're you are thinking about the way the character feels and you're thinking wait they can't talk to that guy because he's kind of a bad guy okay who could they talk to what about the kid at school they could talk to the kid at school now they've got a kind of an action plan and they're going to wait to see what does this character do and they're problem solving, they're developing empathy mm-hmm. and they, they have, they're developing this cognition where, where you can develop an inner world. I can't think of anything though, where they would have to develop like an inner world to imagine anything, say like a spiritual reality <laughs> that w- I don't know where that would come into play. Could you think of anything like that, Jeff? Life. <laughs> Okay, that's good. Life, um, and and the the uh, other thing on that note is that I, I read um, that it's it is a safe way. I know you're into this, but it's a safe way mm. for children to explore strong emotions. Mm. Yes. So they're they're watching um, people in harrowing situations, which are beyond their experience, and they can't. They have trouble even imagining themselves in this scenario, but they hear the author or, or if it's a nonfiction, you're hearing the people actually walking through. This is what I think. This is what I feel. And we're, I mean, you just read a few books. You'll see parents killed. You'll see uh, bad guys killed. These are extreme situations and they're, they're developing some emotional tools. Um, And lastly, and I'll throw this back to you uh, on this note, is, hey, they're developing creativity and imagination because they're going into places they never would have imagined before. Yeah, I I got three things I'm going to add, but I think there's a fair amount of overlap here. Number one is I want my girls to be great writers. I want them to know how to express what's inside their mind and in their heart. And only by reading and getting uh, steeped in not only stories, but in how sentences are constructed, that's what's informing the kind of writers they're going to become. Uh, our friend of ours has taught a high school for years, and we said to her one day, we, and she taught at a very uh, strong high school, we said, what, what makes for the best students and really the best writers? And she said, hands down, it was the readers. Hands down, it was the people who read. The more they read, the better the writer they were. And I think we would say that when we read books to them, we're influencing not only uh, sentence construction, vocabulary, as you said, but also what I'm really passionate about is I want my girls to understand how to structure a story Hmm. because this is, we know, and I'll get to this here in a second, stories are powerful things. And we're, we're experiencing the power of these stories by ingesting them. 
I want my girls to be able to be so great at communicating stories in the future that they can tell truths to people through stories, whether it's, hey, let me tell you about what happened to me last week, or let me explain a Bible story as a story, or let me tell about someone else's story. So I would say I want them to be better writers. Two, all sorts of research shows, you mentioned empathy, but there is actual research that says this is true for adults and children. People who read fiction, there's there's a great article or book, it's, I think it's called On Reading Fiction or The Power of Fiction. Those who read fiction actually are better able to read other humans. Mm. You can under, better, uh, not just empathize with them. I think that there's value to that because you, you're reading about people who aren't like you, who aren't near you. You get, you get to understand them. We've read some books like that. It's really powerful. But also you just naturally get better at reading what other people are thinking and feeling. And that the last sense. one, yeah, the last one, uh, you and I worked for a client a few years ago doing coaching for them. And this woman mentioned this book called The Storytelling Animal by Jonathan Gottschall. And that has become a staple book for me. Now there's a lot of evolutionary crap into it, but uh, <laughs> I love this book because he talks about why stories matter to us humans. And honestly, I, I'm not exactly, I think I read it about once a year because it's so good to remind me and my work and how I'm communicating the hmm. power of stories. And one of the, one of the things he says is stories act as flight simulators. And I think he's quoting someone else, but stories act as flight simulators. Now, why do you have a flight simulator for a pilot? So that this pilot can practice flying through a storm without crashing a 747, or they can, uh, they're testing things with a big safety net so that they can experience things so that when something similar actually happens when they fly, they'll know how to handle it. Yeah. Stories act as flight simulators for us. They allow us to experience events, sometimes big, giant, tragic, world-ending events that we'll never face on our own, that'll, that we'll never face in real life. But there will at least be something analogous in that to something we will have to face. So yeah. it might be so-and-so's got a screwage courage to the sticking place and sacrifice. Okay, well, maybe that's going to help me when I get to a point and I have to sacrifice my time for someone else or let someone else, you know, be first. I love this idea that stories help children and adults understand choices better so that when we have to make that choice ourselves, we're more likely to make the wise choice. Mm. Can you think of an ancient book that uses primarily storytelling to teach us truths? Yeah, the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, yeah, the Bible. <laughs> That's right, the Bible. So God must like this storytelling idea. You might say he designed humans, as your book uh, would, would clumsily say. He designed mm -hmm. humans to work with this operating system, right? Yes. I t yes, I, I, he he gets at that without quite getting at that. And I think C.S. Lewis does a better job of talking about why stories matter so much to him, to, to humans. We, we know C.S. Lewis for his big seminal works and even, you know, his Narnia stories and the, and the planet stories. But he's written a lot about other writers. And he had a he had a real passion for Arthurian legend, the, uh, the whole Arthurian legend world. That was a big thing to him. And how I think that actually had a hand in leading him to become a believer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Stories matter. Okay. So I hope we have clearly established that um, re reading is um, and, and walking through stories is a powerful tool that anybody can pick up. You could do it. So um, if, if money is a powerful thing, uh, which the Bible represents it to, to be, then we would say to you, well, then do it well. D do it in a way that um, honors God and maximizes the tool that's been offered to you. I think I would say the same thing about reading to your kids. If it's such a powerful tool and can form their character and do all this development in them, I would say not only to do it, but to do it well. So I think the one of the uh, strongest things I could say about doing it well would be, one, be very selective about yeah. what it is that you're reading to your children. 
um, it's not hard to go find a list of the of the uh, most um, what would be the word I would use um, the, the most helpful books for establishing a, a, a biblical worldview in your child. So something like the Secret Garden um, it isn't a Bible story, but it's full of really good stuff, um, and it's a captivating story. And there's a lot of empathy and heart and stuff that you know to work meaningful. With. The, yeah. I mean, meaningful, entertaining right. and meaningful. Yeah, that's good. Um, <clears throat> so beside being selective about what it is that you read, I think, and I, I don't know if this is how you feel, Jeff, tell me what you think, but I would think the, num- the number two thing I would say to a dad be- be- besides being selective about what it is he reads is for the love, read aloud in a captivating way. Try well. Read the way you'd want someone to read to you. That's that's great. So um, be 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 fascinating. Be interesting. Be full of something when you read to them. Um, can can I throw out something to, yeah. a side benefit to this? Yeah. I, as a, my job is a speaker coach. So I talk with anybody who's got to give some sort of talk and try to make them sound interesting, captivating, engaging, all that. The one thing I have found has more traction than anything else is I will often pause my coaching sessions and go real quick. Do you have children? Or have you ever read to a kid? Oh yeah, sure. I've read to a kid. I want you to tap into that when you're communicating this. The skills that, so this, let's just, let's take the kids out for a second. Okay. They, they let's take, forget them. Let's just focus on you dads and say, dads, if I can say as a professional, as a professional coach, if you get better at reading to your children, you will have a gear that will make you a more engaging speaker in meetings and in presentations. Boom. That's hot. Whew. Yeah, now, you're not going to go, so CEO, ooh, <laughs> the numbers are down. It won't, <laughs> you won't end up there. There will be a, the levels will drop a little, but if you have the same intonation and the same, I'm hitting things like only a certain way that you do with the child, that's exactly what adults are looking for in an engaging speaker. Hopefully that's, that's what we've been evidencing while we've been communicating here on this little pod yeah, that's great. Cast. So, so um, there are several muscles in this in this body of of uh, being captivating in the way that you read. One of them is um, speed of reading, and you can pr- put a lot of meaning into a sentence by changing the pace at which you read. It's when you can feel this is the climax of the book, this is the kernel of truth they were getting at. I read that snail's pace because over I'm- articulating every little thing. I-, I don't want them to miss it. And I will often mm. say, I'm going to read that passage one more time and do mm. it super slow so they hear. Did you hear what Mr. Beaver was saying about Aslan? And and we'll pause and go, who does that remind you of? What 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 is that? What do you think's going on there? And and talk about it. Well, so another another thing real quick because they're because because give them because they're children, their brains are going and they're coming in and out a little bit like yeah. like anybody like you listening to an like you listening to this podcast your mind is probably going in and out a little bit there's due to give them a break so when you get to those things I, I call it spotlighting spotlight it with your voice let them know this is important in how you suddenly change the way you're reading something that's great another great way to to be captivating in the way that you read is volume so um, you, I, I don't want to steal your thunder, but you, you and I are both reading from the same uh, book series to our kids right now. And there's 50 a couple shades of. <laughs> now, I just did it because you had suggested it and I'm, 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 I'm hanging in. There's a lot there. You've got okay. to. I'm trusting you on it. I'm okay. trusting you. <laughs> okay. Um, and there are some real loud mouth uh, characters in there. Hmm. Well, um, I own the house that I live in. 
<laughs> so I don't have to worry about there being, you know, the, the apartment above me or something like that. So if I'm doing the loud mouth school master, I talk like this. And, and your kids are like, dad, no, this is way too engaging. You are drawing me in too much. I just wanted nice, quiet. Yeah. They love it. Oh, they love it. And also, you know, um, um, we, we just read a section where there's a couple of kids in a cave and they're scared to be in the cave. And so they're whispering like this. What do you think is around the corner? <laughs> well, don't read that like, and they whispered and said, what is that around the corner? You, the, the magic is broken. Don't do that. Just use the tools that are at your hand. And, and if you get quiet when you're reading to them, I mean, we know this from public speaking. You immediately have the attention of everybody if you get quiet. They lean. They lean in. Yeah, it's like producing a song. And if, if you, if if on the third uh, verse you strip back the uh, instruments and it's just the bass mm. and a drum and a voice, you break it down. You break it down. Everybody's going, "What? What's this?" There, he must be saying something very important. That's what you think about the third verse and the way you produce a song. Similarly, when you start getting slow and quiet so suddenly well there's something there's something going on there so i i would well, encourage the pre the precept behind this is and this goes back to delivery coaching it's change change always gets our attention now if you read the whole book like this your kids would lose their ever loving mind <laughs> yes. I, I had to take an acting class one time and this girl in the class um. did her scene real big and the, the teacher was this grand dame of the stage. She, uh, she was in like the Ten Commandments. She was in, she was like the Gina Davis of the 50s, whatever that means. And I remember uh, she just Gina looked Davis at the- Gina Davis of the 50s. <laughs> she, looked at, she looked at the girl after she was done and just stared at her and she said, my dear, if you're always shouting, you're never shouting. And you just watch this girl wither because she had tried so hard. So if you, if it's always loud, that's not going to do anybody any. And if it's always, it's the change. Every time you change, you get people's attention. Whether you're communicating to a boardroom or whether you're communicating to a seven year old, that's great. I saw, and uh, you've seen it too. But um, we are lifelong Sting fans, and we saw an interview with him. And a producer who's talking to him about chord structures and the producer is asking him, now you did something, you did something in the second verse of the song. You didn't do anywhere else in the song. What, talk, talk to me about that. Why'd you do that? And Sting's answer was, well, music is about surprise. Uh, you just want to be surprised at what happens. So I'm, I, I want, I want to regain everybody's attention every, you know, four seconds. Yeah. It's exactly what makes something funny is to be yeah. surprised and shocked at the punchline. You didn't see that coming. And that's what gets our attention in everything is to be surprising. Yeah. So uh, as you say, to feel that change is important. And the last thing I'll throw in, which you've been kind of referring to all along the way is dads. I know that you're a tough guy. Okay. And I know that you can put two four by fours together and you can build a tree house for the kids. I know, I, I know you've got power tools and you sweat and you're, you've got a beard like Jeff, et cetera, et cetera. But you know what? You could do voices for your kids. And th th this, is, this was kind of like the main thing that was talked about in that class that I took about reading mm. is, come on, guys. You, why would you fear embarrassment <laughs> reading to your four-year-old? And you need to do a princess voice because the little princess was scared and she was small. Do, do you think that um, that the rock is going to come into your bedroom and go, you're dumb. You're not a well, man. Well, that, your that's kids not are happening. Go, um, Gosh, this, dad, really? What was he doing or, tonight? Or do you think that the critics are going to be your five-year-olds uh, going like that? A, a few notes. Yes. So, you know, I, I even do this. We, we, I think you and I talked about this um, in, in view of doing this episode is um, if there is a, I don't know, I'm, I'm so uh, uh, um, 
I'm so lazy and obvious with whatever voice I'm doing as I'm reading. So if a guy is from, is from, I don't know, Italy, I'm going to do the broadest Italian accent I can find. Mario. <laughs> sure. And, and it's fine. It's fine. And you don't have to be any good at it. I, we're going to read, we're going to read a couple of passages to you all. Um, it is going to be my favorite part of the pod. And I'm going to, when I did all of the Narnia books, I did them. It's like I produced a one act play and I sold tickets. When we did Narnia, I'll never forget. It was the spring season. Well, of, when we put up Narnia, <laughs> we put up, when we put up Narnia, um, the, these characters would use British words because C.S. Lewis wrote these things, uh, British brain. So I read them as British kids. Guess what? My English accent isn't great. And guess what? It doesn't matter. Because it's better than my kids. That's right. That's right. You just have to be the tallest fifth grader. You're exactly right. So, so fellas, you can do voices like the sad person. You can read someone as the sad person. You can, you can do a cowboy voice. One of my favorite series. I've mentioned it several times on the old pod, little britches. And, and, uh, a, a character I love in little britches is high Beckman. And I just read High Beckman like a cowboy, and he had a high voice up here. He sound, kind of sounded like Ross Perot. And I, <laughs> and I had High Beckman uh, up like this. Well, this kid's a good writer. Come on, I'll show you a trick. And uh, my, my kids couldn't wait until Love High it. showed up because it's going to be fun. He's kind of a zany nut. Guys, you could do a voice like a princess. You could do a monster. You could do a robot. Come on. You can do it. Because you are because here's the thing. You already do this. When you are hanging out with buddies, drinking Dr. Pepper or Budweiser or, <laughs> and just telling stories about your life, you're already doing this. You're doing a voice for that dumb guy at work who just can't figure it out. And then forgive me, you're doing about your wife. Well, she's all like, I've got to do this. You do this gonna... when you're super relaxed. And feel like, look, I'm just, it, two things are happening. One, when you're super relaxed. Two, when you really want, and this is the key thing, when you really want the people who are listening to you to feel what you're saying. And that's the power of telling a story well, is what you're doing is you are making it easier for your children, your listeners, to feel what they're supposed to mm -hmm. feel. And if I had to, if I had to put a banner over everything we're talking about in terms of how you do this, it's I'm going to help my kid feel what they need to feel to experience this story as realistically as possible in their brain. And so if that requires the sad voice or that requires the slow, long buildup, that's what I've got to do. Because otherwise, I'm counting on just in their brain that they're going to naturally feel those things. They're not if I read it flat. Right. They're having to do extra work to get to the point where they're feeling what they need to feel. This is why there's certain uh, preachers we love. They make us, in the way they're saying things, feel things. Yeah. And when we feel those things in the moment, uh, mm. there's all sorts of studies around this. Jonathan Heights, one of my favorite people who talks about this, he talks about any decision we need to make is both logic and emotion. He talks about it like an elephant and a rider, but it's logic and emotion together. And when I tell a story, well, I'm using the content, which is, which is logic, along with this emotion and how I'm communicating it. There's incredible power to that. Sweet. Well, why don't you, why don't you, uh, why don't you uh, tease the people with a, a little uh, example of reading flat versus reading with a little bit of oomph? Well, I'm going to read from this book right here. It's from the Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson, and this book is cheekily titled "On the Dark on the Edge of the Dark Sea of Darkness." If you don't know about these books, I, I had like Stephen. We talked about this before. When you have 20 people recommend a book to you, you finally go, "Fine, sure. I'll do it." Sure. And that was that was us. We had actually, I'll be honest, we had. On a road trip, Jeff got in the yes. We've been friends a long time. I can be honest. We're an hour into this podcast. Whoops. Be honest with me. Okay. All right. First off, your hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wave. 
I've had it since I'm eight years old. I don't know what to do about it. It shoots up here. Wait, real quick. Real quick. Uh, We're just going to pull the curtain back for fans of the pod. Steven has probably the best hair of anyone I know at this age, especially. And yes, it's a constant. It's a con. Oh, I wish I, I wish it was this. That, watch this, guys. Watch this. That, there's, there's, that's, that's, that's nothing anybody wants. So when he's, this is like, this is like Hakeem looking at Muggsy Bogues and going, "Gosh, I, I wish I was a little taller." I wish I was had a couple more inches on me. Yeah, and Bogues is going, "Hey, quit complaining." Oh, that's one of your voices. Yeah, that's the Muggsy voice. Okay, and how often yeah. does Muggsy appear in the Wing Feather Saga? Not often enough, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So in the wing feathers, I'll just read a passage and try to lean into it. Let me say again, you can't have fear of failure in this. You just got to go for it. Your kids are not going to go lame. (laughs) There we go. Deep in thought, Janner. By the way, this book is full of weird names and it requires some uh, 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 proper embouchure. Now, are you going to give us a a terrible reading of this first? Yeah, sure. We'll do a little of that. I'll, I'll lead up to the where I want to read. Okay. I don't know, Nia said, but it certainly sounds like something he'd do. There was another long pause. Whoever it was, I'm thankful. The children are alive. Janner could tell by his mother's tone that the discussion was over. Janner, uh, Jim, uh, sorry, kids, I was looking at my phone for a second. D- Daddy got an email, so... Tink swallowed his mouth full of food and belched loudly. Get me some more chowder, eh, since you're up. Okay, then you don't want to do that. Don't be distracted. Don't be flat. That's requiring too much of your work. Do a little more of this. And by the way, I've been doing this a long time. And so, We're listening to a professional. We can't compare ourselves to you, Jeff. I wasn't going to say professional, uh, but I have been paid to read books before. <laughs> Who's this jerk? Where's Mark Parrott? Why isn't Mark on the show? (laughs) Some guys, some guys working a lathe while listening to this. Who's this guy? No, that is, that is your impression of David Letterman's impression of a grouchy viewer. Of, 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 well, yeah, that's, that's my impression of how I think most, uh, Abraham's wallet listeners. Uh, Uh, What do you, what do you call this stuff? What is this crap? Fast. Two times him. <laughs> Gosh, we're deep in, aren't we? Yeah. And by the way, you know what I realized? And this is, I don't know if this is embarrassing or not, but before we had children, I would read books to my wife. Same. Yeah. We, we yeah, I still do. Really? My mother reads books to her 82-year-old husband. At, they sit by the back window. And sure. I recommended the... the um. I recommended the Little Britches series to them because it it so reminded me of my father's childhood. Um, mm-hmm. And I was like, I want y'all to read these. It's filling in the blanks for me of what dad's childhood was like. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. And they read them and they're like, no, this is fantastic. And, and she reads to him uh, um, uh, looking out the back window at the backyard and the, and the birds that they feed. And she also reads whenever they do any road trip, they've got, they've got some good books they're reading through. So that's kind of, that's kind of like a family value. I, and I love it. Yeah. Well then, I, then that reminds me, I think some of this I picked up from you. So I, I don't think I ever liked listening to audio books on tape or anything like that. That was never interesting to me, but you and I in our twenties, we would go on long road trips and you'd bring a book and whoever was not driving would often read to the other person. I remember we read Heart of Darkness, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Heck yeah. There you go. So anyway, so I'll, now I'll read it maybe the way you want to bring some life into it. I've got about a half page here. Deep in thought, Janner filled Tink's bowl and sat back down at the table. Lily was feeding Nugget bits of food and Tink was oblivious to anything but the steaming bowl of soup in front of him. Janner thought back on every detail of that afternoon and he couldn't think of one clue as to who could have thrown those rocks. The alley was deep enough that whoever threw them had to be an excellent shot. Only two rocks thrown, and they hit their marks perfectly, and they came at the very last second. How could that be? And how was it that Poto and his mother had a guess as to who the mysterious rock thrower was? Suddenly, with a crash and a pirate growl, Poto burst into the room. 
I, what's this I hear about brave little renegades terrorizing the tar out of the local lizards? He roared. Poto hobbled over to Lily and swept her up over his shoulder with one of his giant tattooed arms as she squealed and pounded playfully on his back. Now get in here, lads and lasses, and tell me a tale that'll make me quiver in me boots. Poto kicked open the door with his wooden stump and carried Lily out of the kitchen like a kidnapped maiden. Janner and Tink smiled at one another and pushed away from the table, Tink with a mouthful of butter bread, and Janner with a head full of questions. Close the book up. Oh, Daddy, read us more. Sorry. Got to go to bed. Sorry. Tip jars over here, kids. <laughs> if you enjoy, hey, if you enjoyed what you heard tonight, maybe don't, don't forget to don't forget to be kind. Uh, I, I'm going to match you. Do you Good. have another one for us? No, 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 that was it. Okay, that's the whole book. It's a real short book. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna match you with a with a section from Little Britches. Oh yeah. Um. And uh, this first book, he's about eight years old. So when the narrator is a kid, I try to do kid voice. When it's a uh, when it's a uh, uh, omniscient narrator, it's my voice, and um for something like Narnia books, if I'm trying to pull off uh, uh, British accents, then it's great. You can really feel the change between the character and now the narrator. Cause that's dad's mm-hmm. voice. Um, so I try to go a little kitty and then I'm just going to, this is a, like a kind of a potent scene in little britches. And I just want people to hear um, how I'm going to kind of slow down for the, for the sake of the, the power of, of, um, Father is fa- when father speaks in Little Bridges, it's important because he's a quiet farm mm-hmm. farm guy, and when he speaks, it's important. So, here's this is from Little Bridges. <clears throat> As we came near our house, I could see what looked like three big white sacks of grain hanging from a crossbar at the back of our barn. I jumped off while the bays were making their circle in our yard, and I ran around the barn. Our three biggest pigs were hanging there dead with all the hair scraped off them it kind of startled me at first and i guess father noticed it he came right over and he bent down on one knee beside me and then he put his arm around my shoulder and he said there isn't a thing to be afraid of or to feel bad about son the only time to feel sorry for anything or anybody that dies is when they haven't completed their mission here on earth These pigs' mission was to get big and fat so as to make food for us. They've done a good job of it, and their mission is completed. And I do want you to know this. They didn't know what was happening, and they weren't hurt a bit. They didn't even squeal. Father could always explain things like that to me so I'd understand. (laughs) Great little (laughs) section. Great book. And I'm just illustrating that if you take the text seriously, then your listeners will take it seriously. That would be a perfect time when I would just naturally pause and talk to them Mm. and go like, what's, uh, what's Ralph feeling there? Well, he's scared. He's, you think he's probably fed those pigs? Yeah, I'm sure he did feed the pigs. And he's feeling like, is my dad a murderer? Is Mm. what, what is this? What I'm seeing these animals that I've known a year, two years, and now they're dead. What's going on? Is it right that we eat animals? Hey, kids, is it right that we eat animals? Yes, Dad, we talked about that from Genesis 11. It's okay for us to eat animals. Okay, well, let's just, let's just talk about what the way that Father speaks to him. What did Father see? Why did Father come over and get on one knee and put his arm around him? Well, he saw those looking at his face, et cetera. And we're, just ta- we're just teasing out. I'm just trying to get what's their internal world like, and I'm trying to inform that as as much as possible. I the, I don't know why that makes me think of two little guiding things. Number one, when you ask your kids questions, if they're like, I don't I don't know, I I'm not sure. That's okay. Keep asking. Like you'll get there. You'll wear them down over time. Feed them some ant. Like, is it maybe this? Yeah. M- maybe. Oh, oh, yeah. And if you're like the first few times going, this is so lame. Why am I asking them? They don't even respond. <laughs> keep, 
keep going. Just yes. like, don't give up. You'll, you'll, they will get there. Just be patient. And two, I, I just had this thought uh, cross my mind. It, uh, some of you, it will be helpful for you if your wife's not in the room. Mm. If she's in the room, you might feel a little prone to embarrassment. Now abashed. my wife gets a you might feel abashed, abashed even yeah uh, yeah red in the face. My my wife appreciates my little attempts, so I don't mind. But I would think some of you you're like, I just I need I need peers, <laughs> I need I need other people out of here. I just need to be me and the kid, and it, maybe it'll free up a little to go. It's just us. That's it's good. Just us. I would like to end as I began with the scriptures. So, um, fellas, you should be reading the Bible to your family. And as I said, we'll kind of go over what are, what are some obvious opportunities in your family life for you to do that, but you should be reading the Bible to your family. The same and way, bringing it to life. That's what I was just oh, sorry. about to say. I'm sorry. You know, that's your, it's, that's exactly right. Is don't be lame with you with the, with the way that you read the Bible. Don't be exciting when you're reading the Winnie the Pooh series, the delightful Winnie the Pooh series, and then be lame when you pull the Bible out. Sure. I'm going to pull out. I'm just going to read one of my favorite uh, passages here for demonstrating this from Luke four. Okay, because it's so obvious the emotion is is written in here. Jesus went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. And then the demon threw the man down before all of them, and everybody's kind of going like... Ancient story. I, I don't know what you're talking about. What is this? And we're going on to what's after this? Do we get to play video games for 20 minutes after you read this Bible passage? <laughs> this is how I read this. I, uh, this is how I read this passage. I'm, I, I'm familiar with this passage because we talk about dealing with demons actually in the ministry training. So this is how I read this passage. <clears throat> then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath, he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit, and he cried out at the top of his voice. How do you think I will read this? I'm going to take my earbuds out. The top of my voice. Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. And the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. <laughs> all the people were amazed. And they said to each other, what, what words are these? Oh, with authority and power, he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out? And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Come on. Um, I mean, you're like, let's worship this guy. Uh, honestly. You just because you like, feel it. You feel the emotion that's meant to be communicated. Words on a page are just a jumping off point for emotion. Yeah. And when you read it in a certain way, even, even if you're alone, reading it in your head that that's way true. is important. Our friend David Sheldon is big on read the scriptures out loud to yourself. Well, don't just read the scriptures out loud right. to yourself like this. Right. Read them with punch, read them with power, and you will feel them. Too many people read scriptures and they, do, and they go, oh, I just don't feel anything. <laughs> you might be reading it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, what does David say? I'll praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, I will glorify your name forever. You think mm. that's how he said it? I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. You, you, if, you, if you can read that way with that kind of zeal and passion, boy, it does, it gets in there. So, all right, Jeff, when do you read? When do you read to your family uh, of any stripe, Bible? Fiction, whatever. 
Uh, Bible usually uh, on a weekend uh, gathered around lunch or something, and we'll we'll open it up right there and read a whole story, all front to back. Uh, story books like this, we used to read it upstairs with the girls right as they're getting ready for bed. We've switched down to, we have a puzzle going on the coffee table. They're doing the puzzle. I'm sitting in a comfy chair reading out loud to them and it gets them in a, okay, they're, they're engaged and yes. ready to, ready to drift away. Yeah. That's such an important thing that we didn't mention is that when you're reading to your child at night, there is a calming influence. Mm. They're going into an interior world. Yeah. And so my, my daughters who are a little bit older, they do things uh, also while I'm reading like, um, you know, those right. kind of adult coloring books that are the really yeah. detailed color. And they'll do stuff like that. I got a daughter who likes to knit. So she's kind of busy hands, but available mind. Mm -hmm. So yep. it's, that's what you, that's what they're getting at with the, with the puzzle. So it's great for settling them. And I, I, that's, that's a whole different subject, but I, I want yeah. my kid to, I want my children to be great sleepers. And I, mm -hmm. I, it's, that's one, that's also one of the top things you can do for your children's intellect is get, let them get the sleep that they need and having them watching TV until the moment you want them to fall asleep is the wrong move. They shouldn't be watching TV over two hours before they go to sleep. Just a tip parents. Um, so my opportunities are we read every dinner time. I read a chapter of the Bible after dinner. Well, when I'm finished, nobody's excused from the table. I, I, I open up the Bible and read at dinner time. I have breakfast with my girls. I'm not, I don't have breakfast with them every day, but about twice a week. And when I do, that's when I usually read a story of, of Jesus, a little vignette from Jesus um, w at our Shabbat meal or, or, and or the family gathering on Sabbath. When I do some teaching, we read the Bible then. And then our fiction is, is maybe four nights a week before bed. It's not every night because, I mean, we have to play pickleball. When are you going to play <laughs> pickleball? That's it. I, uh, reading to your kids is important. There's a way to do it well. It's a great tool for, for um, tying heartstrings with your kids and... Um, it's important. We encourage you to do it. And Jeff, as a professional in the industry, <laughs> I, I appreciate your time and giving us some of your wisdom on the power of story in the human heart. Walking away. Oh. All right. All right. Thank you, Jeff. See ya.